years. Good afternoon, good morning and aloha. This is a nationwide webinar, the federal midterm elections impact on charitable nonprofits. Thank you for joining us. I am David Thompson, Vice President of Public Policy with the National Council of Nonprofits. Next slide, please. We are covering a great deal of material in a very short time. So this will be a quick hour where we will be discussing election results, what we know already, uh, and some big picture issues that the candidates ran on. We're going to talk about the lame duck session, which starts probably in a few minutes, uh, at least technically, and could run well into December, depending on how much we do. Depends will help depend on how much successful we'll be. We'll go over the priorities uh, that nonprofits have and what we can do about it. Also, we're going to talk about the 118th Congress. The election has changed things. There will be people and priorities that are different. We're going to dig deep into some sector priorities, subsector priorities, and hopefully we'll have time for Q&A. But as Rick, as we've said at the outset, we've tried to weave answers to questions throughout the presentation. Next slide, please. We have several awesome presenters. Uh, we have several members of the team of the National Council of Nonprofits. There's our president and CEO, Tim Delaney, vice president of St strategy and development, Donna Murray Brown, and my colleague, uh, Jessica Mendieta. We also are honored to have several experts, special guests joining us as Laura Walling of Goodwill Industries, a co-leader of the Relief for Charities Coalition that hopefully every one of you belongs to. We also have Jody Levison Johnson with Social Current, formerly known as the Alliance for Strong Families and Communities. So you have a good idea of her human services focus. Tony Shivers of um, Dance USA and Opera America is here to discuss cultural and arts types of issues that are uh, will be very important upfront and personal in the 118th Congress. And we're joined by Stephen Wolf, hopefully everyone's favorite tax uh, nonprofit tax lawyer, because he's certainly the smartest. Let's go to the next slide, please. I am delighted to introduce, to, to kick off our the president and CEO of the National Council of Nonprofits, Tim Delaney. Tim. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, and more importantly, thanks to you all for tuning in to this webinar. Um, it's really important for nonprofits to come together right now. Uh, and um, I, I want to just focus everybody's attention right now on the fact that this is this webinar is about the policy work of nonprofits at the federal level again, at the federal level. Uh, and we're gonna be focusing largely on the legislative branch and not the other two branches. Certainly there's gonna be some overlap with the executive branch, but um, we always have to be cognizant that there's activity going on at the state levels as well. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that I really wanna focus on is the importance of nonprofit unity right now. Uh, we have discovered that we as a sector are more powerful when we operate with our numbers. There is power in numbers. We need to come together and unify. We have witnessed how powerful we can be, um, such as with the CARES Act, um, when we got nonprofits in there for the PPP loans and a lot of other things, because we came together as a sector. We need to always remember that experience of coming together as a sector for unity. Next slide. The second thing we need to do is to recognize that that unity happens at and through the state and local levels. Uh, we've all been watching television for the last week to see who's gonna be winning the house, who's gonna be winning the gubernatorial elections. We've discovered one more time that uh, what happens at the local level matters, what happens at the state level matters. And so as we're looking at federal issues, even though we're talking about the feds right now, it really is gonna require everybody at the nonprofits to be organizing through your state congressional districts and your Senate offices so that you all are then having a unified voice together. So when your state associations of nonprofits reaches out to you and ask you to sign on to a letter to get to your member of Congress, please operate with this notion of unity. So we're going to be operating in unity through the lame duck for the next few weeks. We cannot afford to sit on the sideline as a sector. We must get engaged on behalf of the, the organizations, the communities, and 
of the individual people that we are serving constantly. Um, our experts are going to be given a preview of what's ahead in the next Congress. Uh, and uh, that future is cloudy. Uh, I just uh, saw on the news that 18 of the congressional seats have not been decided yet. So we don't know um, how much or even who is going to be running. It all looks like it's going to be um, the Republicans will control by a very slim margin. So we will have divided government again. All this reinforces that with the U.S. Supreme Court saying it's all about states' rights and kicking things back to the states or a divided government in Congress, uh, we are going to see a lot more coming to the state level. Um, and we cannot afford, though, to uh, ignore the federal level. So with that, I turn things back to David. Thank you, Tim. Let's, so election results, let's be very quick about this. Uh, next slide, please. We There are a lot of unknowns. We don't know whether the Democratic majority in the Senate is going to be 50 or 51. That'll be decided in Georgia. House control. New York Times just reported about half an hour ago that the House, the Republicans seem to be taking the House, but there's still several votes to happen, as we will discuss in a little bit, uh, who's, who are going to be the leaders. All of the all of the key leadership positions are in flux, which means committee heads are changing as well. So we we don't know a lot. We know that the margins are very very narrow, which means that the extremes in the parties perhaps have a lot of say. But that also means that organizations like charitable nonprofits could have more influence because we, you are grassroots. We also know that $16.7 billion was spent on essentially a status quo election. Again, the House might, uh, looks like the House is going to change. Imagine what the charitable nonprofit could have, community could have done with that money. And then this last item is what they ran on. Republicans who won think they are thinking that they are, they won because they made Biden the, the, the main theme or inflation, crime, and immigration. Democrats ran on abortion and their results and democracy. And like ships passing in the night, um, frequently they don't agree as to what happened. So we charitable nonprofits will be adapting our message, recognizing that our audience will, has a completely different perspective on things. Next slide, please. Very quickly, just because there are some things to celebrate, uh, Vermont, has finally joined the modern age. It's the 50th state to have a woman representative uh, representing them in Congress, in, in the House. Um, I think Mississippi was the penultimate state. Uh, Katie Britt has won as the senator, first woman senator for Alabama, Summer Lee, first African-American representative in, in, uh, from Pennsylvania is coming in, and Delia, or Delia Ramirez will be the first Latina from uh, representing in Illinois. Um, Native Americans, Mark Wayne Mullins, representative from Oklahoma, has now been elected the first, uh, at least first Native American rep, uh, senator from from Oklahoma, not the first in the uh, in the Congress. And the one that's most shocking to me as an old guy is that the first generation Z representative, 25 year old Maxwell Alejandro Frost, uh, won Val Denning seat in Florida. So the generations they are a changing. But so those are the some, some election results that we found interesting. Uh, please, let's go to the next slide and let's talk lame duck session. Next slide. Just to set, set the stage, must pass legislation. They've got to resolve the appropriations, whether it's an omnibus uh, spending bill that covers all 12 departments or all 12 uh, appropriations bills or whether a continuing resolution is to be determined. We think it will be more, more likely an omnibus. That matters to nonprofits with earmarks. Earmarks is the old word, there's new names for congressionally directed spending. Uh, about a billion or $2 billion of the proposed spending for the fiscal year 2023 will go, would go directly to charitable nonprofits through uh, infrastructure programs and things like that. So that, the, Earmarks don't happen if it's a continuing resolution, so it matters. We also have defense authorization, which is a big deal, and a lot of other must-pass things that are usually outside the scope of what nonprofits talk about. Next slide, please. On the wish list of items, respect for uh, globally, uh, 
that the press is talking about and many members of Congress care passionately about Respect for Marriage Act passed the House uh, pending over in the Senate. Uh, electoral reform, electoral college reform to make sure there's not a uh, January 6th, 6th type of insurrection or at least the calls for it in the future. Debt ceiling is something. It's the, there's a looming fiscal crisis if uh, Congress doesn't raise the debt, debt limit, the debt ceiling. Ideally, they can get it done now instead of later or sometime in 2023 so we don't have a government shutdown threat. Two other items there in blue, natural disaster uh, tax relief, my colleagues are gonna talk about as well as the uh, year-end tax package. But there's some things in there um, of importance to nonprofits either directly or uh, as a need to mobilize, motivate tax legislation. Democrats are very eager to pass a child tax credit. It was around last year, it expired. They wanna restore that permanently or at least get it going again. Uh, many in the business community are seeking the research write-off, the research the immediate write-off of research expenses and some other depreciation. So it could be the makings of a tax deal, which would create a tax bill. Also, Secure Point 2.0 Retirement Security is a bill that has some powerful retiring members of Congress, Port Senator Portman of Ohio, uh, Kevin Brady of Texas, current ranking member of the House Ways and Means Committee, are both eager champions of this bipartisan legislation. And in there is the legacy IRA bill, the language, and a couple of other items. So the things in there that matter to to the nonprofit community. But those are the structural items to set the stage so that nonprofit policy priorities can come through. Let's go to the next slide. And I'd like, I'm introducing my colleague, Donna Murray Brown, Vice President of Strategy and Development at the National Council of Nonprofits. She's been in our network as former chair of our organization, as former CEO of the Michigan Nonprofit Association. So she she speaks nonprofit and, and charitable giving. Donna Murray Brown. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Well, again, my name is Donna Marie Brown, Vice President of Strategy and Development at the National Council of Nonprofits. And I'm here today to really state the obvious. Charitable nonprofits need additional resources to rise to the demand of services. And we need Congress to act now on three charitable giving incentives that, are allowed to ex that were allowed to expire at the end of 2021. The provision that got the most attention so far is the Universal Charitable Deduction, otherwise known as UCD. It was created on a bipartisan basis in the CARES Act of 2020. It was also expanded on a bipartisan basis at the end of 2020 to allow individuals to deduct up to 300 in charitable donations and couples to deduct up to $600 in donations, even again, even when they take the standard deduction. The success of the charitable universal charitable deduction is unmistakable. So here's what I want to share with you. We only have data for 2020, but it generated about 11 billion. That's what the B in giving in the depths of the pandemic. More than 42 million taxpayers took advantage of the UCD. Importantly, a quarter of those taxpayers, more than 10 million, were people earning less than $30,000 per year. That is, the people who needed to take the tax break the most received it for giving away their money to help others. There's an immediate and obvious fix for us here. Congress should enact the strongly bipartisan Universal Giving Pandemic Response and Recovery Act. That bill restores the UCD and raises the non-itemizer deduction ceiling to better than $4,000 for individuals and $8,000 for couples. Polling data shows that 85% of the public support restoring the UCD and better than three in four or otherwise 77% support the pending legislation. Now I wanna quickly address two more expired charitable giving incentives before I turn it over to Laura Walling. In every piece of disaster relief legislation beginning after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, Congress has encouraged charitable giving by, by enacting two incentives. I'll say it again, every disaster relief legislation over the past 17 years has included charitable giving incentives. So, and folks in uh, Florida in particular, that they know that natural disasters are hitting our country harder and harder. More than ever, we need relief right now. 
The first provision is permitting individuals who itemize to deduct the charitable donations up to 100% of adjusted gross income, 100%. The other measure allowed corporations to deduct charitable deduction donations rather up to 25% of taxable income. Both of these can make a real difference for frontline nonprofits struggling to keep up with demand, but Congress has to act as soon as possible. So now I will turn it over to Laura as a leader of a major nonprofit coalition on these issues and more, and I trust you have some words of inspiration and action. Laura? Thanks, Donna. We're going to have to take you on the hill with, along with us, uh, given the passion that you clearly have for these issues that are of such great importance for the sector as a whole. Um, additional issues of equal importance, believe it or not, because they sound a little boring and look so on the slides, right? Employee retention tax credit, super important. Many of your organizations probably took the employee retention tax credit, particularly if you're uh, working with a larger nonprofit that wasn't initially eligible for the Paycheck Protection Program. The ERTC really allowed uh, nonprofits to continue to provide their services during the height of the pandemic. And what did Congress do? Take it away. They ended the program early because they were looking for some pay fors also of importance in the infrastructure law that is now being implemented. But this was funding that was already designated towards this program and they had it end a quarter early. So it was a great opportunity for nonprofits and for-profits to come together in the aptly named Employee Retention Tax Credit Coalition. And we are seeking reinstatement of this tax credit for that fourth quarter. We've had great success thus far in creating awareness and building support for this uh, reinstatement. A bill in the House, H.R. 6161, and an identical companion bill in the Senate all have bipartisan support. The House bill has 113 co-sponsors, actually. Uh, the Senate bill, we have 12 co-sponsors, again, bipartisan and of some influential lawmakers on the key committee that we're interested in, which is Senate Finance. Um, so we'll continue to work there. We know that many of you may also be waiting on the IRS to send you your check for the initial ERTC that you filed. We've also been creating awareness with Congress, letting them know about the backlog. Uh, National Council of Nonprofits, I know it signed on to a letter to let the IRS know that, uh, our sector is experiencing this backlog as well as we're still waiting on those funds. Um, so we're continuing to sound the alarm there. But again, the focus for our legislative piece though is getting that reinstatement uh, of the ERTC for that last quarter. The other pieces around the volunteer mileage relief uh, admittedly, for Goodwill Industries International, whom I work for, this hasn't been a top issue of ours, but I think it's a great example of something that brings the sector together, whether these are high priorities for your individual organizations or not. To Tim's point, kicking us off with talking about unity, we need to have strength in numbers, we need to have one voice, and if an issue is helping one of us, ultimately it's going to help all of us. So the volunteer mileage relief is an example of an issue where we're looking for some parity on the for-profit side um, with an increase in the rates there. That's another bill where we have some bipartisan support uh, and particularly in Minnesota carrying the water there um, with HR 8265, but the Senate version, which is S3625, both Minnesota senators have introduced that bill. Um, 8265 on the House side, it's 10 co-sponsors at this point with some bipartisan support. So next slide, please. Where does that leave us? The time to act is right now on all of these issues. With just a few weeks left remaining in this session during what is known as the lame duck, it's the opportunity for lawmakers to 
they have their last hurrah if they have one foot out the door. But more importantly, because we're likely going into a session of divided government, as was noted earlier, it's a chance for the current regime uh, with Dems having control of both chambers to shepherd a number of these items through the door in the waning weeks. So while folks are thinking about their holiday vacation plans, we are certainly still going to be pounding the pavement and the lawmakers and their staffs will be there uh, hearing from all of us collectively about these issues and that we don't have time to wait, particularly with charitable giving incentives as we're going into Giving Tuesday and the end of the year when people are thinking about making their donations. Um, the ERTC, where the further we get away from pandemic relief, uh, it behooves us to also speak in terms of this being a component of disaster relief. Um, but you know, all the more reason to raise that awareness now. So with that, I will turn it back to David. Thank you very much, Laura. And the next slide emphasizes a statement of that you have the opportunity until 5 p.m. Eastern today. Operator standing by. Uh, I don't have the link. I can't put the link on the on this system that we're using, but we will get it to you as quickly as we can. Uh, for those who want to sign on to a statement showing your support for the universal charitable deduction, I think if you just Google the Charitable Giving Coalition, it'll pop right up. We're going to try to get this, the recording and the slides out as quickly as possible, try to turn them around this afternoon, right after this. So we will have a sign on uh, form there. But as Laura said, and she was absolutely right, uh, the this is the time um, the, today, they're coming back in the session, and today the staff are in the process of putting the bills together. And the more they know that the nonprofit community, the more they know that bipartisan bills are there waiting to be included. We're not talking about freestanding votes on each of the bills that Laura and uh, Donna talked about. We're talking about mushing them into a final tax bill or putting them into a, a disaster relief bill so that it's one vote instead of 20. And that one vote's a lot easier. And the goal is these are bipartisan. Everybody knows they're, they're good sound policy. So they just need some extra oomph from all of you on the call and all the people you work with. We do have, um, uh, we do have a question that uh, Laura, you touched on it, but uh, perhaps you can um, offer a few more thoughts. Is there any opportunity for organized efforts to get the IRS to process existing ERTC applications? There was the recent letter, but uh, you have thoughts? There was the letter um, and this question, Thank you for it. It validates the fact that you know what we're hearing at Goodwill too. A number of our Goodwills are frustrated with not getting their relief right away. I know of one that had initially filed in 2020 and just received their check last month. Um, so it is taking quite some time. However, as uh, I know David has shared in his uh, regular updates out of National Council on Nonprofits, there's a helpline that may be of assistance through the IRS. It's designed for CPAs, um, but for your CPA that your organization may work with, they may have some luck in getting through and at least putting it on their radar that your particular organization is still waiting as well. David? Steve, Stephen Wolf. If I could just uh, add on to what Laura said, and she made a really good presentation regarding ERC. Uh, I think that also working with members of Congress to try to pressure the IRS. I think anytime that you meet with a member of Congress, or even if you're not meeting, reach out to the office and ask about the ERC. Uh, I know that, for example, the New Jersey Association was in uh, last month with uh, Congressman Pascarell from the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, he's been reaching out to the IRS. I think the more pressure of members of Congress, especially members of the, of the uh, Finance and Ways and Means Committee, uh, to get the word to the IRS, uh, the better it will be. There is an article in today's Wall Street Journal that says there's still about 250,000 941 Xs that are, that are still pending at the IRS. They're going through them. They are working on that backlog. 
At the same time, they're also training auditors to, to, to go out and look at ERC claims to make sure that they are proper. So, uh, but any pressure you can do with your congressperson, I think can be very, very helpful here. And for the record, ERC and ERTC is just a difference between uh, regular people and tax people. Uh, so thank, thank you for that. Uh, I say fondly in my, and, as well as jokingly. Uh, I'm trying to put the link to the Universal Charitable Deduction letter into the, uh, into the chat or, or into the questions and answers. I might be failing, but we'll make sure you get it. Next slide. Let's move on to, uh, we're right on time. Let's move on to the 118th Congress. Lots, lots to opine and imagine. And I'm turning over the, the big picture reviews to my colleague, Jessica Mendieta. Thank you, David. So what we know now is that a lot of the new elected uh, representatives and senators are currently in D.C. for their orientation. So a lot, lots of conversations are happening. So everything we say is what we know as of 2 p.m. today. Um, on the Senate side, it looks like uh, not much change will happen. Senator McConnell from Kentucky will remain the minority leader and Senator Schumer from New York will remain the majority leader. Um, there are more questions on the House side. So Representative Kevin McCarthy is set to become um, next speaker if Republicans manage to hold on to, the, to their majority. Um, it will be a little slim, but there are other conversations happening um, about what the priorities will be for the GOP. Uh, for the Democrats, it's possible for uh, Representative Pelosi to stay on another term, although there are other conversations on, I guess, what would a passing of the baton look like? So right now there are three names being floated around, um, Hakeem Jeffries from New York, Catherine Clark from Massachusetts, and Pete Aguilar from California. Um, reports have shown that they've been engaging some support, but um, there's also reports that um, there's preference for Representative Pelosi to stay another term. And that's what we know as far as leadership goes. And next slide, please. Um, for the tax committees on the finance side on, in the Senate, uh, Senator Wyden is set to remain um, the chair and Senator um, Crapo from Idaho uh, will also remain the ranking member. And let's see what else we have on the House side. Um, it's also looking like Representative Richard Neal from Massachusetts uh, will remain the top Democrat on that tax committee. Um, but there's also other conversations happening on the Republican side, given that uh, Representative Brady from Texas is retiring at the end of this Congress. And the other uh, committees that we're keeping an eye on are on the appropriation side. So on the Senate, it looks like we'll have two new leaders with Senator Patty Murray from Washington and Senator Susan Collins. Uh, Republican from Maine. Um, on the House side, it um, doesn't look like there will be much change with uh, Chair Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut and Kate Granger from Texas. Um, but one thing we'll just kind of note right now is that when you look at the images, it, it's an all-female leadership um, on both houses. So um, progress, glass ceilings, uh, we keep making them happen. Um, so some of the big picture priorities, once leadership gets decided and other conversations are happening, um, appropriations for fiscal year 2023, there is a continued resolution that will expire towards the uh, middle of December, um, but hopefully that gets settled by then. Um, if not, it will be extended probably till 2023, but hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, other conversations are on the debt ceiling, depending on leadership um, and the final composition in both houses. The other issues that are being discussed right now are continuing aid to Ukraine, um, child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, um, other provisions from the 2017 tax law that are set to expire in the next few years, um, immigration, and just other issues around childcare, uh, workforce development, um, and labor. Let's go to the next slide. Let me introduce uh, Stephen Wolf, you, whom you've already heard from, but Stephen Wolf is uh, the tax guy. He, you, know, you need a tax guy. He's the one. We, he's the go-to fellow for the advocacy side of the charitable nonprofit community. Stephen, what do you see as the big stuff, the big issues for 2023 in the tax well, policy arena? Uh, uh, well, assuming that. Uh... 
the Republicans take control, uh, I, I think that uh, there may be some deadlock in terms of getting major tax legislation through. I think that uh, at the margin, there might be some tax bills that pass, uh, but I don't think you'll see major tax legislation because of the split uh, in the two houses. Uh, just to amplify on leadership, uh, if the Republicans do control the House, uh, there seems to be a battle between Vern Buchanan from Florida, the Sarasota area, and two Smiths, Adrian Smith from uh, Nebraska and Jason Smith, I think, from Missouri. They're the three likely candidates to become chair of the Ways and Means Committee. So look for that uh, fight uh, during leadership battles uh, on the Republican side. Uh, but I, let me just go through these policy priorities, if I could, David. Uh, the three major categories. Uh, Donna did a great job talking about uh, what's pending uh, at the lame duck, along with Laura, regarding charitable contribution deduction than UCD. I think, again, if it, this does not pass during lame duck, there'll be a, another push in 2023 to move the UCD again. I think, though, a, a real major issue as it pertains to charitable contribution deductions may be the treatment of appreciated assets. We saw over the last several months two huge donations of stock going to C4 organizations, not C3s, but going without any taxation, uh, allowing uh, capital gains to not be taxed on those uh, donations to C4s. I think there'll be a lot of questions about the treatment of appreciated assets to both C4s and C3s at the next Congress. And look for Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island to continue his battle against so-called dark money uh, looking at this issue. So I think that's where the charitable contribution battle could be from a policy point of view in 2023, 2024. Again, not there may not be major legislation, but look for a debate over this issue. Uh, turning quickly to plan giving, two major areas, donor advised funds, uh, the ACE Act that was introduced in both the House and Senate during this past Congress, I think uh, has pretty much laid out the battleground, if you will, between uh, DAF proponents uh, and uh, uh, DAF proponents of reform and DAF uh, proponents of the status quo. Uh, I, th I think it's pretty clear that the that legislation we reintroduced in the next Congress. Uh, Senator King is already working on another version of his bill on the Senate side. Uh, so uh, that could that again, I think, is going to be an issue where. Uh, donor advised funds will continue to get a lot of attention. There's an article in today's Hill magazine by one of the opponents uh, against staff uh, legislation that people can look at uh, to get more background. Uh, and also the Treasury Department has issued their guidance for 2023 regulations and several DAF provisions are on that list. They go back to 2006, but look for the Treasury Department to be a big player in donor advised funds over the next three to six months. Moving quickly to endowments, uh, I think that there'll be some potential movement on the university endowment tax that was passed in, in, uh, by, the, the, by the 2019 tax law. Uh, both uh, there are proponents to increase that tax uh, and, and proponents to decrease that tax, both of uh, which would tie their legislation to increased tuition relief. So look for some changes there as well as a continued sort of uh, anti-endowment spirit on Capitol Hill. Uh, both, this is very heavy at the staff level, but also some members feeling that uh, charities should be using their money now, not saving it for the future or for a rainy day. Of course, we know, all know the importance that endowments play uh, in uh, the charitable sector. Finally, looking at the IRS really, really quickly, we talked about the backlog uh, in the EO division. Uh, especially with ERTC or the ERC. Uh, the, the IRS continues to work on that, uh, but it's a, it's a huge, huge issue, both for uh, regular returns, as well as for the 941 X's, the amended returns to get the ERC uh, monies back to uh, uh, businesses and nonprofits. There's a lot of debate uh, over the so-called 80 billion versus 87,000 IRS agents coming at your door with their, uh, uh, you know, with their guns loaded. Uh, the $80 billion was put in by the uh, Inflation Reduction Act to give uh, the IRS a chance really to catch up 
uh, to where they were many several years ago in terms of their personnel. Uh, of course, on the Republican side, there's been talk about uh, repealing that $80, $80 billion or making sure that none of those dollars can be used in, for any audits, uh, especially for audits for those under $400,000. The final item I, I would mention quickly is the form uh, 1023EZ. We are hopeful that the IRS will look at this form again very seriously. There's been a lot of publicity over the last several months about the uh, about IRS basically rubber stamping uh, 1023EZs and all of the fraudulent uh, organizations that are able to get nonprofit status by filing through the through the 1023EZ. Uh, the National Council has been working on this issue for several years. We'll continue to work on this issue uh, to ensure that. Uh, you know, that the, that the system uh, remains transparent and that only proper nonprofits are getting that exempt status. Uh, so with that, David, I think I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Stephen. We're seeing some questions coming in, but let's, uh, let's cover uh, two of the subsectors and then we'll do some questions at the end. Next slide, please. Tony, arts community. Thanks, David. Out the next two years, you're planning on uh, taking action. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. And, and my organization's Opera American Dance USA appreciates and values their relationship uh, with uh, the National Council of Nonprofits, as well as the Charitable Giving Coalition and the uh, Relief for Charities Coalition. Uh, and it's a pleasure to, to be here. Again, my name is Tony Shivers with Dance USA and Opera America. Uh, my organizations are also part of uh, the Performing Arts Alliance, with, which is a, a coalition of 18 national and international uh, nonprofit organizations within the performing arts. And so, as you can imagine, uh, the, uh, our, the sector and, and PAA specifically have been working, uh, you know, through historically uh, to ensure that there's bipartisan support of, for, for the arts. And so, regardless of whoever controls Congress or the White House, we will continue to do so and galvanize that support so that the creative economy can be supported uh, going forward. And we've had a history of bipartisanship, particularly during this uh, pandemic. And so as just an example, just one example, the shuttered, the $16 billion shuttered venue operators grant program that provided uh, funding for those performing arts uh, venues to those nonprofits and for-profits that otherwise owns, manages, or utilize performing arts venues for their performances of public programming. That was initially introduced as legislation by one of the most conservative Republicans in the Senate, John Corner from Texas, and um, Amy Klobuchar, a Democrat from Minnesota. And so there's bipartisanship um, for the arts and cultural sector. And again, the sector is, is steadfastly uh, uh, um, ensuring that that bipartisan support continues. Uh, there are um, about five major uh, House and Senate arts uh, cultural related caucuses. There's four in the House, uh, there's one in the Senate. Uh, and so we will be, um, you know, aggressively, the sector will be ensuring that this, these caucuses are well represented and that we maximize uh, participation um, in the House and the Senate. These are, as you can imagine, groups of Republican and Senate congressional members who support the arts, who uh, ensure that the federal, federal arts and cultural agencies have the support that they need to support the arts and cultural sectors in re their respective states and local communities. And so that's uh, something that an objective that we'll be uh, encountering and, and working on, uh, not only starting now, but also um, going through the 118th Congress. All sorts of pending issues and legislation that the sector is, is uh, interested in that has been advocating on and that we will continue to advocate on through the 118th Congress as they start up in, in January 2023. Obviously increased uh, appropriations for all federal arts and cultural uh, agencies. Uh, critically important, particularly for the National Endowment for the Arts, which is the only um, agency, if you will, public or private, as far as funder, that actually touches all 435 congressional districts, all states, 
and uh, District of Columbia and all US territories. And so increased appropriations for that um, um, agency as well as all the other federal agencies that directly impacts the, the sector is critically important. But not only that, there are also the other federal agencies that may directly or indirectly impact uh, the sector. So think Small Business Administration, Department of Energy, Department of Labor, um, Though and the part US and also the US Department of Education that actually houses arts education programs that are that's funding that's sent to local school districts all across the country. These are also agencies that are critically important and that we're also ensuring that they have the increased capacity to be able to um, support the, the sector going forward. Uh, tax uh, policies and programs. Uh, it was mentioned earlier by my colleague, critically important for the sector and their engagement with their do respective donor communities and potential uh, donors going forward. And so we are uh, supportive of those things and have been really active in ensuring that these pieces of legislation are, are passed as soon as possible. Uh, the, the, as my colleague indicated, the, report, the employee retention tax credit program that was eliminated for the fourth quarter of 2021, that was a lot of money that the sector actually relied on. And so we've been working aggressively to try to get that reinstated through bipartisan legislation that has been introduced in the, in the House and the Senate. And then beyond that, there are other pieces of legislation that actually goes to support the creative economy going forward and individual creative workers. As you can imagine, because of the pandemic, Pre-pandemic, there were um, over 5.1 million creative workers. As you can imagine, because of the pandemic, uh, performing arts venues uh, and other organizations were and, and uh, companies were the first to close and they have been the last to reopen. And so one of the major issues they have been dealing with is trying to get the general public back. Uh, they have been experiencing since they have reopened uh, low to moderate ticket sales. And so how can we support the creative economy and the individual creative worker going forward. And so that's where a lot of other federal agencies come into play as far as, for example, the Department of Labor and their workforce development programs. For example, the Department of Energy, they have a nonprofit energy efficiency program that will go towards ensuring um, those um, facilities that are operated by nonprofit organizations are um, energy efficient, and then they have the resources to do that. And so there are a whole host of other issues, including equity within the sector and across the country that are through legislation that has been introduced already that will be more than likely reintroduced and that we will try to uh, get that passed in the 118th Congress. And then lastly, I'll mention there are other work that needs to be done at the, at the federal agency level. And so if you remember, one of the first um, um, uh, executive orders that this current president signed was to advance racial equity and to support underserved communities through the federal government. As a result, more than 90 federal agencies have developed and released equity action plans, including those federal arts and cultural agencies as well. And so the sector will be working with those agencies to ensure that equity um, is is maximized and is addressed through their work, whether that's access to a variety of federal government um, grant programs or the data collection for the sector so they can utilize that in their work. All of that work is important across the federal agencies. Uh, and then as well as there was a uh, proclamation by the, by the current president, not only to recognize the National Arts and Humanities Month last month, but also ensure that there's interagency collaboration across the government in helping the federal arts and cultural agencies to, to support the sector. So a whole lot on our plate, but the sector is, is steadfast in ensuring that the work continues and that we're working with the nonprofit sector to support the creative economy and the nonprofit sector. So thank you. Tony, you're not kidding. There is a lot. And I hope everyone who is in the cult arts and cultural community, as well as beyond and other subsectors recognize there's a lot of overlap and a lot of consistent themes in what Tony was talking about that can relate and build and support the things that you're talking about as well. Let's go to Jody, uh, Jody Levison uh, Johnson with Social Current. Could you share some human services uh, agenda within the human services community? 
Absolutely. So um, thanks for having me. So, you know, I think others have noted that the, the status quo election really could bode well for some key priorities. And we've talked about universal charitable tax deduction and then the employee retention tax credit. Um, and I think that said, with the potential for a Republican controlled house, and I saw in the Q&A that folks are saying that, that, that they're calling it now, um, I think that the human services sector definitely has some concerns given the known policy priorities of the, the Republican party. And so, you know, this includes things that could lead to the blocking of additional concrete economic supports that have helped families through the COVID pandemic, um, some, you know, proposed cuts to Medicare or to Social Security, which um, Americans rely on daily. And so some of these things could really prove to be bad news for the human services sector, um, even more importantly for the, the people and the communities we focus on. And so I think, you know, across the board, the concerns that we hear from every corner of the human services sector and examples from our network outreach, which includes over 1,800 organizations, are just a general fear that politics is going to override policymaking and that like historic victimization or villainization of low income families and communities will resume and result in disinvestments or attempted disinvestments in the social and human services programs. So, you know, I think what we're really thinking about is that we've learned so much during the pandemic about how to support people, how to support communities, um, and about the positive impacts in the long run um, that it occurs when we invest in efforts to address the social determinants of health. And so I think federal and state policies that connect people and families to economic supports, um, you know, PPP loans, housing assistance, other concrete economic supports have really moved the needle on really important areas like um, childhood poverty, where we know um, recent reports are that child poverty has been reduced by 50%. And so um, we think that these modest investments in programs that prevent these types of things from occurring, from poverty from occurring that could help even help uh, abuse and maltreatment are important investments for government. What we saw actually related to abuse maltreatment is that during the, the pandemic and when the country was in lockdown, calls to child abuse hotlines declined. And there was really some concern about that reduction, about what that meant, and did it mean that, that things weren't being detected? Um, what we now know from studies and a recent article that was published in uh, JAMA Pediatrics is that wasn't the case, that it wasn't that abuse was occurring and it wasn't being detected, um, but really that prevention was working, that investing in families, offering concrete economic supports, eased family and community burden and stress, and resulted in outcomes. And so these types of policies are the kinds of things we would like to see continue to be top of mind and to be considered, um, and with the Republican House, that may or may not happen. So um, the other thing I want to talk about is access to reproductive health care. I think the American people really signaled um, with these results that the overturning of Roe was an, an issue for them. And so from a human service perspective, we see our research has shown that an abortion ban would disproportionately impact people of color, which I think ties to uh, Tony's point just about race equity and the focus of this administration on those key issues um, compared to white women, black women are less likely to access prenatal care um, and are less likely to, um, or excuse me, are more likely to be uninsured and face significant financial barriers. And so, you know, a lot of people have thought this is a, po a politics issue and really for, for our network, it really isn't. It's um, And for those who are supporting our thoughts on this, it's about health equity and access to care. And so um, it's, again, and I think a great example about why attention to advancing equity and racial justice needs to be a continued focus. I think we've all kind of experienced the workforce challenges that are um, that are happening in the sector right now. And so employee retention tax credit is certainly a wonderful thing, um, but really some of the things that we're seeing in the human services sector is during COVID, there was a real recognition of, um, of first responders and really for the initial parts of COVID that was really relegated to hospitals and nurses and ambulance and police and fire. And those people are absolutely first responders, but so were the direct line workers in human services organizations. And there was real slow recognition of that. And so it took its toll. It's on the emotional well-being of the, of the sector's workforce. 
And, you know, community-based nonprofits are losing uh, staff in droves and not being able to compete with places like Walmart and Target on wages and benefits. And so, um, like I said, the ERTC will help, but the problem is broader than just wages. We've also heard from graduate programs that areas like social work are not seeing the enrollment. And so things like student debt relief and loan forgiveness are definitely part of this equation when we think about how to solve the workforce challenges. Um, and, you know, I just want to comment the financial health of our sector has long been an issue. In 2018, um, we issued a report on, um, on the, the state of the sector, and it was called the National Imperative. And at that time, we were noticing that um, that CBOs or community-based organizations couldn't realize their full potential and their full impact because of the financial challenges they face. So that one in eight community-based organizations were technically insolvent with liabilities exceeding assets and cash reserves less than um, less than one month. And so government policies, including state and federal contracts that fail to pay for the full cost of nonprofits to deliver service, um, it continues to exacerbate this issue and we can't just stage a walkout because people's lives would be at stake. Um, and so I just think it's something for us to think about how as a unified sector, we talked about the power of numbers, how we start to combat and really address the need of full coverage cost contracts. Um, especially in light of what we know is this mental health crisis that we're facing right now in America. Um, you know, the Surgeon General recently issued an advisory on the youth mental health crisis. And yet what we also know is because of the workforce crisis and because of reimbursement rates um, that um, our network is um, not able to recruit and retain staff and is closing programs or forcing people who are desperately in need onto wait lists. And so if we really all agree that there's a mental health crisis, then we really need to solve the workforce crisis in order to address the mental health needs of the broader um, population. So, you know, when I think about this, you know, President Biden indicated in a speech that he really wants to work across the aisle. And so, um, I think we really need to have a government that's willing to work bipartisanly to address the challenges we're facing. And um, that means um, that that people need to work across the aisle to really support nonprofits that are providing essential services, that are first responders, um, that help keep communities strong, so that, that government is reliant on the, the human service sector and the partnership between nonprofits and the, um, and the government and the nonprofit human service sector is critical to thriving communities, to thriving families, and then the ability for all of our nation citizens to achieve their full potential. So I think really for for us, it's, it's thinking about student debt relief and which is, you know, now in jeopardy and federal incentives to increase reimbursement rates and then really looking at other ways we can look at contract and procurement reform and um, the equitable distribution of federal dollars. And then, of course, I just want to throw in the last thing is affordable child care to help support um, all of us. And, you know, if it costs more money for a human service worker to go to work than it would to stay at home. If it actually costs you money to take a job in the human services sector, why would anybody do it? And I think we just have to pay attention to that. So those are sort of the things that are on our mind. So thank you, David, for, um, for letting us share that. Thank you, Jody. And I bet everyone on the call recognize that it's, a, it's wonderful that everyone is working at the many different pieces that affect all of our uh, all of the work we are going to do. I had some questions. We're, we're short on time. I have some questions, but Jody has answered four right there at the end. We, the National Council, the networks of the National Council of Nonprofits and the Relief for Charities Coalition have gone all in on the issue of the nonprofit workforce shortage. And one of the very critical details, issues that need solving is the uh, scarcity of affordable uh, quality child care. So that's that's a that's not just a subsector issue. That's a broad sector wide issue. Um, so I'm not going to ask you that, Jody. But uh, you mentioned you ended talking about bipartisanship, and I wanted to ask Tony if you could briefly respond. Why is it that all of the arts and cultural bills, uh, efforts, programs you have underway tend to be bipartisan? What is it? What's you? Is it unique about your advocacy? The fact that you're in every community. What do you think it is? I think it's a combination of, of many factors. And, and thank you for the, the question. I, I think not only the sector brings that the creative uh, component to the table and 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 providing a wealth of entertainment and creative to create creativity to local communities and families, but also it is an economic engine for 
uh, state and local economies. Not only that, but they are a uh, engine for ancillary industries. So think construction, think hotels, think restaurants. And so um, the, the sector is, is just critically important, particularly at the state level. Uh, and local level in terms of employment, in terms of e economic activity, as well as the creative component. Thank you. And I think I, this is beyond dispute that the arts and cultural community does absolute best job of compiling data and displaying data in a creative and creative way. Uh, and that helps as well. We could all learn from that. I'm going to ask all the any of the speakers who would like to make closing comments to do so, but I want to ask Laura, what is it? people should do now? Should they wait until next year once we see all the election results? Or is there anything at all they could be doing right now? There is plenty to be done right now. So whether it is via action alerts, the sign on letters, Twitter, carrier pigeon, get in touch with those lawmakers uh, during this lame duck and give them something to do. Tell them about your needs, Tell them why it is that we need that universal charitable deduction. Tell them why it is that we need the ERTC reinstated and additional support for that uh, increase to the volunteer tax mileage as well. So stay Thank tuned you. and I just add on to that, the David, a plug for National Council on Nonprofits. You guys are the ones who are sending out the specific action items and the links and step-by-step -step instructions on things that folks should be doing and how they can easily get engaged. So thanks for doing that for us. It, it is teamwork and Laura and I are on calls every week uh, early in the morning. Uh, this is a collaborative effort. You might call it a conspiracy. It's all for the good of the cause, good uh, for the sector. Uh, closing comments uh, of my Speaker friends, please go off mute to signal to me if you do have something you'd like to sh to say at the end. We will, there will be, the recording of this will be sent out as well as a PDF of the slides. I'm not sure if we can do the um, the transcript of the closed caption. I'll, I will ask about that. Uh, but we have, well, because of the conversations, we weren't planning it before, because of the conversations, Jody brought up the nonprofit workforce shortage. Um, Laura pounded the issue of the coalition uh, activities and what you can do. There are, there, are, there are letters that have been sent up, and we do have a corrected link that we've sent to several of you of the relief for, or for the, I'm sorry, the Charitable Giving Coalition sign on letter. I sent out the wrong link. But uh, for those of you watching live, you know that the, the, elect, the House has not been called for sure yet. Those watching on tape recognize that we're, this is Monday, uh, and the uh, counters are still counting. So we're uh, moving through. We wanted to get the information, get the coordination, the collaboration out there as fast as we could. Um, and Stephen Wolf, I see that you've gone off mute. Do you have a closing comment? It's just that we should be looking for really for any uh, train leaving the station for uh, UCD and charitable relief at year end, especially looking at a disaster relief package. As Donna pointed out, almost every year after major disasters, and there were several uh, this summer and in this fall, and even just this past week in Florida, uh, taxes are part of it. So get there, get part of it. Okay, thank you. Tim Delaney, you have the final word. Unity. And uh, act now with a lame duck and be prepared to pivot quickly to then go to the state level because it's all coming to the states. Thank you, David. And thanks to all the expert speakers. Thank you, Jody, Tony, Laura, Stephen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, and Donna and, um, and Tim and uh, Jessica. It's been a pleasure. We'll get this out to you as quickly as possible. Thanks, everyone. Let's hold together. <laughs>